company of forward thinkers with more than 55,000 employees around the globe and products in 58 customer countries, Raytheon has established itself as a trusted partner. From detection to action, we give our customers a decisive advantage. Customer-driven, technology-powered, Raytheon, revolutionizing defense capabilities. Hello, and welcome to the Emerging Tech Horizons podcast. I'm Arun Serafin, Executive Director of NDIA's Emerging Technologies Institute. On today's podcast, we're going to talk about supply chains and how they can be better analyzed using some advanced analytics, which can support companies and the government in understanding and managing risk in those supply chains. Department of Defense is one of the largest operating budgets and complex supply chains in the world. How can they create a centralized view of all of that data? Their operating budgets consist of thousands of businesses and accounting systems, all of which contribute to their defense supply chains. Many of these uh, uh, elements rely heavily on traffic of data from lots of external systems and sources. Very complex system, hard for any centralized location to manage. Today's DOD's data-centric operations are making prioritizing data on interoperability and understanding that data a very key need. Discussing all of this with me today is our guest, Mr. James Gellert. James is the chairman and CEO of Rapid Ratings, a financial health data and analytics company based in New York City. He's a recognized international authority on corporate risk management, supply chain risk, the health of public and private businesses, and U.S. ratings regulation. He's run a number of commercial firms in and out of the financial sector, and he's now at Rapid Ratings focusing on financial risk for credit and supply chain risk professionals. Please join me in welcoming James to today's podcast. Thank you, James, for joining us today. Thank you, Arun. It's great to be with you. So I tried to do a little bit on your background. I'm sure I didn't do it justice at all. Can you tell us a little bit more about your background and how you are now at Rapid Ratings and, and maybe touch on what Rapid Ratings actually does? Sure, happy to. And you did a great job. Uh, my, my background prior to Rapid Ratings was originally as a banker. Uh, and I came out of school and got uh, directly into investment banking, where I focused on raising capital for uh, for private entities, for corporations, as well as for financial institutions and for sovereign entities around the world. Uh, so my focus was non-U.S. companies coming into the U.S. markets to fund. And in that process, uh, I really got a foundation in liability management, risk management, ratings, um, how companies are portraying themselves and how institutional investors think about companies and how they uh, interact and trade their securities. And uh, then eventually I got into the tech world because I, even though I loved banking, the tech world was sort of this great allure and I uh, became an entrepreneur and uh, a few companies later, uh, having done everything actually with, uh, with one business partner, a gentleman named uh, Douglas Cameron, uh, with whom now for 23 years, we've now run uh, five uh, different companies. We uh, ended up buying uh, Rapid Ratings and partnering with the uh, original founder of the technology, a gentleman named Dr. Patrick Caragata. And uh, we uh, got in Rapid Ratings very, very early, but uh, Dr. Par uh, Dr. Caragata had built a really fascinating architecture using some early technology for evaluating what we call corporate financial health. And uh, Rapid Ratings uh, now is the leading provider of risk management uh, from a financial perspective for companies and supply chains around the world. Uh, so we've been doing this now for about 15 years. And uh, Rapid Ratings uses advanced technology that, uh, that we've continued to, to modernize and, and to add uh, elements to, and we'll continue to do that. But it really came from a pretty brilliant uh, foundation that uh, Dr. Caragata came up with and that we've been applying to uh, our current uses and our, and our clients range from companies in defense and aerospace uh, to uh, companies in 
and uh, across pharma and uh, food and beverage and retail and textiles, really about 25, 26 different industries, as well as some of the leading financial institutions, about 75 of the leading financial institutions around the world use us also to evaluate the public and private company suppliers or customers that they work with. So I can understand the, the tie to the commercial sector, certainly the financial sector. Help me understand how this then relates to the defense industrial base and defense missions. How does, how does understanding this financial supply chain risk uh, contribute to DOD trying to execute its missions of procuring the right things, getting them delivered and sustained and used to, 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 to meet all of the mission demands that DOD is facing? Well, I think the the needs of the DOD in many respects are very similar to the needs of a, phar- a pharmacy company or a pharmacological company or from a textiles business or a heavy, uh, heavy manufacturing. It's really about being able to produce on time at specification at good cost. Uh, but creating resiliency in the supply chain. Now, with the DOD, the supply chain is is responsible for delivering readiness to the warfighter. Um, but uh, there are analogies across every industry for those who are spending money to create and or to supply an activity. Uh, and what's interesting about the DOD, of course, is that the the stakeholding entities and areas that it is responsible for, obviously across aviation, land, maritime, uh, include medical and subsistence supplies and clothing and textiles and construction and on and construction equipment on and on. And so the the challenges that the DOD has in evaluating the quality of suppliers and maintaining a strong, resilient supply chain are exactly the same ones that supply chains are tackling around the world uh, across industries. The really wonderful thing about that for the DOD is that tools and techniques and uh, and theories and processes around creating better supply chain is consistent and is, is now becoming a more well-trodden path. So it's not like the DOD and the constituent uh, members of the uh, of, of the uh, the industry are trying to go this alone. And so there's really quite a bit out there and more and more dollars being spent and more innovation coming to managing data to uh, creating tools that provide predictive analytics for the DOD and really everyone in the industry. So, okay, let me unpack that in a couple of different ways. First is um, when I'm thinking about defense supply chains and current market conditions, from your working with these companies and working with DOD itself, you know, how would you say current market conditions are affecting the defense supply chain? Or are there particular things that that DOD or NDIA should be worried about right now? Well, the, the flip side of worry is opportunity. So let's uh, so let's let's try to talk about both. But the, the 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 things to be concerned about now are that uh, in every supply chain there are a disproportionate number of private companies than there are public companies. The typical supply chain is comprised of roughly 75% private companies. And some of those private companies are small to mid-size enterprises. Some are, are true middle market. And then a very small percentage are large companies. Then, of course, there are the public companies in a supply chain as well. But the the conditions that have been affecting both public and private companies for the last X number of years sort of leaning into COVID and then obviously the COVID crisis, a whole nother dynamic that has been thrown on top, has created something of a perfect storm. And that perfect storm includes things like disruption from uh, COVID that still continues, even if it isn't making the same headlines and ports are a little clearer and, uh, and we don't have the same trucking problems that we did in the middle of COVID. We still have residual challenges that suppliers around the world are going to be carrying for quite some time due to the strains of getting through the COVID crisis and all of the related issues. But on top of that, you have economic conditions. And the economic conditions most specifically revolve around two things. You've got inflation. And inflation is particularly 
challenging in an industry that has a lot of fixed uh, price contracting because the the pain that is born from inflation goes up the supply chain into smaller and smaller companies that have to incur higher costs of labor, higher costs of parts, and can't pass those costs through. So it squeezes their margin and creates financial health strain and burden on them. But the second piece is uh, interest rates. And uh, and these are, of course, closely related. But with higher interest rates, you've got two major factors. One is that for the last uh, 12, 13 years post the financial crisis, we've had an artificially low, we've had a period of artificially low interest rates. And that has meant that companies of all credit qualities have been able to borrow with impunity. And it, there's been almost zero cost of capital for most companies. But Weaker companies, smaller companies, newer companies have had the same access to capital as much larger companies. And historically, that's an aberration. So what it has meant is that, and and then you throw COVID uh, uh, public funding on top of that, that kept a lot of companies that were degraded because of COVID alive, which in and of itself was great, but it meant that there's more masking of problems inside of people's supply chains due to ample liquidity then they know. And so as interest rates have risen and affect private companies more than they affect public companies, and why is that? Because most of them borrow from banks and this floating rate uh, lending. So as rates go up, it costs more for them to service that debt. All of these things are intertwined. It's creating a much, much tougher environment for private companies in particular to be able to continue to deliver and be able to continue to innovate. And that is a real challenge. As their liquidity goes down and they're less able to to borrow again and refinance old debt at the same prices, and they're paying more for the debt that they currently have, and they can't pass through cost increases that they're getting from inflation. It's a squeezing effect that's happening on 75% of most people's supply chains. And if if they don't know where those problems are, it's really, really hard to manage it. So I can see absolutely how this affects directly smaller companies that are members of NDIA, but I now I, I can understand that the, the bigger suppliers who have lots of subcontractors also need to be aware of those kinds of constraints and pressures on smaller parts of the supply, uh, smaller companies within the supply chain or even themselves. And then even the government as the buyer and, and, and depending, like you said, to keep the readiness up by depending on companies to deliver goods and services, they sometimes assume this supply chain is going to be there. It's robust. It's financially healthy. Um, And you're saying that, especially today, risks are putting all of that into question. So I guess, okay, that's a nice way of saying that's the problem. And now we'll try to talk about the solution a little bit. Who's sitting on any data that could help you look at some of those issues and identify risk? And then what kinds of emerging technologies, maybe advanced data analytics, can help you look at that data and make some assessment of risk. So there's there's a ton of technology uh, out there and companies that are attacking different parts of supply chain and supply chain resiliency. Some of them are looking at it from a uh, from a platform perspective, being able to create dashboards and uh, and uh, uh, data management tools. And some are, like us, focused on very specific domains of risk and providing the best insight into those particular risk areas, whether that's environmental, in our case, financial, whether it's uh, cybersecurity. All of these are, you know, there's a little ton of innovation, ton of uh, focus, smart people, dedicated people creating businesses that are focused on these things. Um, but in order to maximize the any of these tools, each company that's trying to manage its own supply chain or each entity that's trying to manage a supply chain really needs to start by being organized about the way they're thinking about data. And this is one of the big challenges that we see companies, particularly older, more established ones that have uh, sort of historically tried and true they would think, ways of managing risk, if they're not adapting to the greater amount of data that's out there and the emerging risks that are much more complicated than they were 20 years ago, 
then they're not putting themselves in a position to be able to capitalize on any of the and I, and I do think where uh, sort of a uh, a warning we should all just have in mind is it's easy to think about something like AI as a panacea. It's easy to think about AI as this thing that's going to come down the, the, the pike and just sort of fix all of our, uh, our data problems by identifying what they are and then creating the solution. But if one isn't actually organized well enough to be able to use any of those technologies as they continue to get developed, they're not going to actually help. And, and we find, you know, there are some very sophisticated entities out there who want to be better at risk management. And then you get into a conversation with them where you say, can you please provide a list of your suppliers and the contact information of your principal contacts at those suppliers? And they freeze. <laughs> and, they, and, they, and they think, well, geez, that's going to take us months. That's all about being organized and data management and the digitization journey that a lot of companies uh, are in and want to be in needs to start foundationally at getting organized the data they already have. And if they can't organize the data they already have, then they're not going to be able to take in the reams of new data that is available and be able to match it and use it well. The other piece that, that I think is really important is having an architecture and a mandate internally at any organization to know how they want to manage risk and manage it across the different risk areas. And what's, what's behind that comment is, that a lot of organizations still silo risk management. Somebody in IT is responsible for looking at cybersecurity in a supplier. Someone does financial, maybe. Someone does uh, ESG, who's trying to learn what ES and G actually are. And so you, and someone's doing compliance, traditional compliance. And then you've got people doing logistics and quality and delivery timing analysis, things like that. But if all of them aren't brought together, in a way that is cohesive, then uh, there's a tremendous amount of inefficiency that happens and opportunities get missed and problems get missed. So people end up being more reactive than proactive. So what I certainly recommend is that any organization that is thinking about data and thinking about becoming better at risk management, make sure that there is internally a mandate and that there is internal coordination. So things like the deteriorating financial health of a company alerts people who are monitoring the cybersecurity in that company to the fact that they may need to be focusing a little bit more on the fact that that company is not going to have the same dollars to invest or could be cutting corners somewhere or simply might need some more help. And so th that kind of ties back to what's the opportunity here. So the opportunity is to understand and use data better, but it's to engage more with suppliers. It's to collaborate more with suppliers to create the resiliency that actually provides the uplift in any and, and the ROI in any of these investments that people are making in, uh, in better risk management. And the, the curious thing is every private company and public company. But every private company in the world today knows that it is a more challenging operating environment than it was five years ago. And one of the best ways for them to be able to manage through more difficult times is to collaborate better with their key customers and or the key prospective customers that they'd like to be working with. And that collaboration, that willingness to discuss what is going on inside their businesses that can be determined and identified through data and analytics. Now is the time for companies to, and any entity, to improve their risk management, particularly with private companies, because the private companies are more amenable to it than they've ever been. And that's one of the keys. So one of the best ways that risk management is actually becoming true value added right now is leaning in and creating more collaboration with suppliers and, and, and data and analytics and predictive analytics allow people to get scale so the individuals who are responsible for risk management can do more with more of their suppliers than they've been able to do in the past. That's all a great collection of opportunities at a time when there are more problems to be managed. And so when you're talking about the use of data analytics and even, let's say, AI in, in taking some of those siloed risk assessments 
and integrating them into a real management tool. Does that management still occur in people's brains with their business acumen and their wisdom, or it's, can that also be replaced by data analytics and AI? There's a there's a futuristic element to AI, which of course eliminates the people. Um, I happen to think that AI will be best used when it is used by people and when it is used by those who can interpret and provide uh, both a an experience, both an experience, context, and um, and wisdom to the data that's that's coming out. That doesn't mean don't use AI, but it and it also means don't be defensive that AI may replace a job. Uh, AI will make jobs more efficient. That may mean that there are fewer people needed to do jobs when people historically have just thrown more uh, full-time employees or outsourced or part-time employees and things. But I don't see it uh, actually replacing the need for people to interpret and make decisions around that data, not anytime soon. And we need to be clear that, and I think particularly in the DOD, because the criticality of what is being measured and what is done is so high and people's lives are at stake, it's incredibly important to not leap to a futuristic state. It's really important to be adaptive with technologies that, that are going to be um, uh, accretive in the short and the, and the medium term, but not to try to leap to the long term too fast. So in the near term, at least, the, the, the complex analysis systems, a better use of data is going to feed into human decision makers making decisions. Um, uh, let, me, uh, let me ask you this relationship between the customer and the vendor and the partnership that needs to be developed um, and the healthy sharing of data between vendor and customer, um, how do your tools support that? Because at some point you need to draw some lines, right? The, the vendor doesn't necessarily need to share everything with the customer and the subcontractor doesn't need to share everything with the prime contractor, right? So can the tools be designed to create healthy sharing, but not oversharing? Yeah, it's a it's a very sensitive question because uh, you know not everyone believes the same amount of data is oversharing or undersharing. Uh, so uh, some of it's situational. Um, the the companies that we see doing the best job of managing risks in their supply chain look to their suppliers to to be prepared to disclose information. And to disclose information, data, insights in a way that is productive to the relationship and meets criteria for managing risk, not for oversharing. And, you know, certainly we see suppliers, private companies you know, all around the world, and we've rated private companies from uh, 140 some odd countries. So, you know, this, these, these thoughts are from a, a pretty widespread activity that we've been doing now for a long time. You know, most of the private companies are prepared to disclose if they think and are assured that the data is not being used against them. Right? It's a very, it's a very sort of fundamental issue. If a supplier feels like the data that they are asked for is going to turn be turned around and used to negotiate against them at a contract renewal, uh, then they're less likely to. Disclose it. Uh, financial is it's interesting. The companies that we find are often the most reticent to disclose financials to us to be rated tend to be the ones that are the strongest because their feeling is, well, if my client sees what my margins are, they're going to try to crank them down. Right? And, and that's not productive really to either side. So you know, we have a roughly, it depends on industry and program, but you know, in the 80 to 85% success rate in having uh, private companies around the world disclose financials to be rated. And that's because we coach our clients to, uh, to adopt a collaborative approach. And once a, uh, once a private company discloses financials and realizes that it actually has helped them, 
regardless of what the outcome of the rating is, uh, then you know, then you've got a, a, a lifetime discloser. And what I mean by that is, you know, particularly in difficult times like we're in financially right now, a lot of private companies most companies don't want to switch suppliers, right? You have to start with that, with that uh, approach. And if a supplier is weakening and you can identify what those weaknesses are and talk to them about them and make sure that the supplier understands what those weaknesses are and hopefully they're ahead of the game and say, yeah, we understand we've we've got high uh, high interest costs relative to our size and here's what we're doing about it or we've had a deterioration in operating margin over the last two quarters and this is why this is what we're doing about it this is how we're uh, becoming more efficient in our work and capital management this is how it affects you positively as our customer that's exactly what every supply chain risk manager really wants and needs it's to make sure that they're engaged in a dialogue and we used our technology to create reports that not only analyze the uh, the financials and compare them against now 12 million company years worth of financial data but we have reports that actually drill down into what are the five most important questions to ask this rated company so a supply chain risk manager can actually have it in front of them and sit down for a qbr or an ebr or a, a, a diligence session for a potential new supplier say so we'd like to talk to you about these things and it's not only uh it's not only the question it's the context behind it why should you ask this? Why should you understand uh, the answer and and how to how to put the answer in some sort of a framework that makes sense, even if you're not financially trained? That's the kind of thing that you would call narrow AI, and it is about using technology to help enhance uh, a human activity and to enhance a human activity that is workflow. Uh, benefiting and that creates scale and consistency and replicability of process. And all of those things are critically important, particularly as supply chains are more complex and, uh, and scaled across the, across the globe and across industries. So I'm curious about one particular supply chain concern that the Department of Defense has a lot. Some of the big suppliers talk about it as well, which is foreign influence in the supply chain or even dependence on foreign sources in the supply chain. How do you think data collection, better data analysis can address those kinds of issues? Well, one of the big challenges in supply chain is of course, sub-tier visibility, and it's very closely related to, to your question. And sub-tier visibility is something that is really hard and it's particularly hard if you don't have your tier tiers one involved and collaborating with you to understand tier two. So it, there has to be a, a relationship between entity and its critical prime suppliers or tier one suppliers to be able to understand better what's happening upstream with tiers two and on. And that really means communicating a, uh, a need and a desire for the most critical suppliers to have their own supply chain risk management programs as well. And we'll often see clients of ours extending tools and services and data and analytics like ours to their tier ones so their tier ones can do critical risk management of their tier ones so there is transparency. But where, where AI uh, and other technology comes into play here is in being able to identify where there are inconsistencies. So when we're looking at a set of financials and it goes through our system and is being compared against those millions of, of other company years uh, historically, aberrations in that data stand out. And it's one of the benefits of being in big data and having analytics that can uh, look for abnormalities and, uh, and normalcy and can understand how a company looks when profiled against other companies in its industry, in its geography, uh, of its size, and so forth. And so there's a, there's a lot that companies like us are doing to help with those problems, but there isn't a silver bullet for it, but it really is about trying to understand where there's exceptions and managing those exceptions. Um, we're running out of time. I want to close with a science-y question. So th these are complex technologies that you're you're developing and using, 
Uh, I'm sure your workforce is very technically highly trained. Tell me about where this, uh, where these ideas are coming from, where your workforce is coming from. What's the role, for example, of government-funded research, university research, in developing some of these tools and models that you're applying then for your clients? Well, so our, our ideas come from ourselves and internally, and from clients. Uh, so you know, we we espouse collaboration and we try to adopt it and uh, and it is very much a part of the way we interact with our clients to understand what they need and to talk to them about ideas and to iterate with them and to and to innovate for them uh, we would love to be doing more uh, collaborating with uh, with government and universities on research and uh, and development and that's something that uh, that would benefit us and benefit our clients so uh, very eager to do that and now speaking to the NDIA members, you're, you guys are an NDIA member, and um, uh, those members are big, small, and universities. How, what advice would you give them to get more information about these kinds of tools and how they could use it in their own businesses? So uh, ours, you can you can come to our website, of course. Uh, other uh, other technologies out there uh, are doing a pretty good job of of promoting themselves. Um, but we do we've got a pretty extensive partnership program where we work with uh, companies that we think are best in class in sort of adjacent risk domains, and a number of the companies that are in the uh, governance, risk, and compliance platform space. So uh, some of that information is available on our site, but we are, as a collaborator, we are very happy to receive calls from people who are asking for something that isn't what we do, but where we may have advice and uh, relationships that we can uh, make introductions to. So we're, we're very happy to be that resource for people. That's great. And I hope you're a resource for us at ETI as well. Love to keep collaborating with you on looking at data analytics and advanced AI and how it can support a lot of different departments' missions. And so with that, I want to thank our guest, uh, uh, Mr. James Gellert, for joining us today on uh, this week's episode of the Emerging Tech Horizons podcast. Thank to you to all the audience for joining us this week. Um, if you enjoyed this podcast, please don't forget to hit the like button in, in, on your screen and subscribe to our channel to stay up to date. Thank you.